uh, on the anniversary of February the 14th. It was like uh, several days late, but part of a long series of anniversary uh, webcasts that have been given this past week as like to commemorate the uh, Pearl Uprising 11 years on uh, from today. The subject of today's talk is on authoritarianism and its destabilizing influence on Bahrain. More specifically, one of the things that we have hoped to do here today as I, and throughout this time has been to reflect not only on the past 11 years in Bahrain, but the overall repercussions of policies that have been enacted there. For many that are involved in human rights and democracy in Bahrain, the aftermath of the Pearl Uprising is one of tragedy, as well as one of missed opportunities and tremendous disappointments. As more specifically, when we talk about the aftermath of the Pearl Uprising uh, with the Bikki report, as like and the promise of reform, for many it is uh, a story of broken promises. As there, as despite the flaws that existed within the framework, as like of the Bikki, as like, it was one that was built partially by consensus with the international community and one that provided a clear roadmap to reform within the country. However, eleven years on from now as many of those reforms have failed to materialize. As has been discussed in previous webinars over the past week, we have seen that human rights abuses to a certain extent have been reduced in Bahrain over the past 11 years. However, we've also seen civil space, a civil space close. We've seen a renewed attempt to whitewash Bahrain and its international profile. And we have seen a degree of complicity from international actors on this as well, which has enabled ultimately authoritarianism to continue within the country. And one thing that we have seen in this past week with protests and violence and mass arrests is a repeat of the same stories that we have seen over and over again in Bahrain, which continues to evince that the root causes uh, of unrest and instability in Bahrain remain. And, how the, and we hope not only to ruminate, but also to reflect as like on how the system that exists in the country enables these systems to continue as like, and ultimately how we are able to work together is like, and remedying that situation as we go forward. We have an excellent roster of speakers here today. Uh, each will have about 10 minutes uh, to give an introduction to their work as well as their own perspective on the past 11 years. And as like, we will then have a short uh, question and answer period with myself as like followed by a longer a period of question and answers from the audience. Our first speaker today is Professor Stacy Strobel. Professor Strobel is, is currently assigned at Shenandoah University as like where she is a professor of criminal justice. Professor Strobel is the author of Sectarian Order in Bahrain, the Social and Colonial Origins of Criminal Justice. In 2009, she won the Rodinowicz as a memorial prize for her work in the British Journal of Criminology on the criminalization of female domestic workers in Bahrain. Her main area of specialization is policing and issues of gender, race, and ethnicity and religious identity in the Arabian Gulf. Thank you so much for coming, Professor Strobel. Justice. Thank you so much Dr. for Strobel that kind of introduction. Of order and, um, and thank you for inviting me to reflect um, on the 11th year after the, the Pearl Uprising. Um, I hope that um, my remarks will circle back to one main message that I would like to convey. Um, which is that I uh, remain very um, optimistic about the future, despite uh, many of the things I'm going to talk about and many of our speakers are going to talk about, um, because um, many of us on this call and around the world uh, who care about issues of human rights in Bahrain, we continue to work. Uh, despite the odds, we are doing what, what we can um, in a difficult circumstances, whether we're scholars, activists, um, anything that we can do. And so I just wanted to send out a message on this 11th anniversary um, that uh, in solidarity with all those, those efforts. Um, my work um, on Bahrain uh, has really been on the what uh, scholars often call the long durée in French, uh, the long history of Bahrain, which um, really puts my work um, perhaps a little bit outside the frame of what's been happening since the Pearl Uprising. Um, but one of the questions that I've been asking myself, and I don't, I don't have an answer 
necessarily is, is what we're seeing in the last 11 years different than the uh, political repression and authoritarianism uh, we see from the Al-Khalifa regime or have seen since their conquest um, of the islands um, in the late 18th century. Um, and so part, to partially answer my own question, I do think that we're seeing something that is a current crisis that has a relationship to, to many current crises um, that have gone on beforehand. Um, in an article um, from Miriam al Khawaja, uh, a few years back, uh, she made the comment um, in reflecting on the uh, Pearl Uprising that about every 10 years, there's a there's a major sort of moment where Bahraini people rise up and say, you know, we would like our human and civil rights to be incorporated. We want to be uh, viable partners in, in civil society and in the political process. Um, and she's right uh, that it keeps coming up time and time again. Um, and so the, the Pearl Uprising is yet another example, um, but in many ways, um, and here's you know where I'm starting to think, is this a more de devastating uh, moment because the uprising was so clear and strong and, and organized. Um, and here we are 11 years and it has been um, unfortunately very effectively silenced through many of the mechanisms that Andrew just mentioned. Um, it, you know, if I had to put a sort of gloss on it, I would say the authoritarianism and repression is working, um, but that does not, and we should not feel that that at all uh, mutes uh, the importance of the movement, the strength of the movement, um, and the legitimacy of the claims that Bahrainis would make for their own country. A lot of my work is focused on history because as part of the Al Khalifa regime's uh, tactics and strategies, uh, it's very much about establishing, as we all know, as a Sunni dominant space where the actual history of the country, its historical landmarks, uh, the narrative that the ruling family puts forth is the narrative from the Al Khalifa point of view, and that has taken on the, uh, the glean of being the only history or the official history. Um, but what I'm have found in my work and uh, would like to continue to highlight is when we look at the experience of Shia, Baharna, Ajam, indigenous Bahrainis, we see a trajectory of marginalization and an oppression that again goes back to the conquest. We are talking about groups that have been enslaved uh, by a feudal overlord, okay, the Al Khalifa family who stole lands. Um, and we are talking about the ghettoization of this, these communities into small village enclaves uh, of places and spaces where the socioeconomic benefits that Bahrain has to offer are not equally distributed. Um, we are seeing subjugation and repression over generations. We are seeing the criminal justice system being used as a weapon against its own people should they dare to complain about this. Um, and it's not just after the Pearl Uprising, though we're seeing a lot of that. This is, as Al Khawaja and many, many other scholars have pointed out, um, a playbook that the Al Khalifa have had for at least 100 years um, since they were emboldened through their encounter um, with British imperialism and their relationship to um, the British and their um, interactions in the Arabian Gulf in, in the early 20th century. And I really want to highlight this history uh, and do any, anything I can from my small perch, and I encourage you all to, to remain steadfast in, in giving voice to this hidden history. Um, it's still important. Uh, any, any ears that can be reached change, help change the overall narrative, because ultimately we need to reach the ears of some pretty powerful people, whether they be Western allies, uh, regional power brokers. Um, we need to get this story out there to understand what's really at stake here and how bad it's been the last 11th years, 11 years. I was really dismayed recently. I was on a call with a, a group of um, political scientists um, and I was really dismayed to hear from one who uh, I won't name because um, this was just a comment and the person did not have a chance to really develop their idea. Um, but this person said that the Pearl Uprising was a failure. And it was a failure because the movement, uh, the, those that came out in, in support of a, a less 
authoritarian, more democratic state had no vision. They didn't have a plan for how they would rule. They didn't know how they were going to make any of the kind of economic uh, changes and or um, overcome some of the economic networking that the Al Khalifa have captured, for example, the relationship with the Saudis. Okay. Um, and it really, really caused me pause. Uh, as you know, I'm a criminologist, um, and I think it's pretty clear um, that this is that the folks that came out at the Pearl Uprising are victimized by their own government, government, or are allies of those that are victimized by their own government. And so, when a scholar says that movement wasn't good enough, I saw some victim blaming, um, and and that really disturbed me. It the message was very much like. The, the people failed, not the Al Khalifa. They haven't failed for 300 years. They don't need to do some work. Protesters, go back and do your, do, do your work better. Do your work better when your family is dragged, uh, family members are dragged and disappeared into prison. Do your work better when your family members have been executed through overuse of the death penalty, uh, trumped up charges of terrorism, uh, but, you know, just do some more work under those conditions because dispossessed and traumatized person, it's your responsibility to change things and to change things more perfectly than everybody else who has all the more power. So I was pretty, pretty upset, as you can hear by the tone of my voice. And it wasn't a forum in which I could really, um, you know, engage in an argument about this. But it's not the first time I've heard this. And I'm sure this you may have also heard this um, in your work, those of us on this call. Um, and, and it struck me that this is why it's so important to keep talking about the hidden history in Bahrain is so that the victim blaming can't work, so that we're really clear who holds the cards here um, and who has been the authoritarian and who has the responsibility to change. All right? The international community has standards. Um, the report last year from Salam DHR on decades of oppression laid out all of the things that the international community should and, and is concerned about, the three to 4,000 political prisoners, the dissolution of civil society groups, the outlawing of the opposition political parties, uh, the use of executions after mass trials without due process, 150 forced disappearances of people who are reportedly against the government, and the 700 or so um, and this number might be old. I'm sure there's been more since this is this number is about a year old of citizenship rev revocations as collective punishment for the Pearl Uprising. And so I think and I just I'll, I'll sort of wind up in the next minute or two. I don't want to take up too much time. I think. Um, you know, that victim blaming is something that may be affecting um, folks that are, are doing the good work. And I say this because in recent months, I would say in the last six months, um, when I've been interacting um, with folks in this community, I've noticed a, a very strong sense of fatigue, um, a sense of feeling like nobody's paying attention. Where is the US? Why are they still selling arms to Sunni despots in the region? Where is the United Kingdom? Why are, why are all the economic benefits still going to Bahrain despite this human records, rights record? Uh, why do we still have US and British military installations on Bahrain, which is, which is a huge economic boon uh, to, to Bahrain um, just in that? Uh, why is this still happening? Where are um, the, the folks that claim to uphold democracy and, and standards of international human rights, why are they doing this? And of course, you know, those that are in international relations can, can move the chess pieces around and tell us why this is happening. Um, but I think it's important to say, we all know why it's happening. We all know the geopolitical concerns. I think the point here is that this is immoral, unethical, uh, and cannot be tolerated. I think that's a fair point. Um, and I don't want that ever off the table, whether we're being academic or uh, not. Um, and so what I would say to folks is um, the fatigue is because we're tired of making these same arguments. The fatigue is because people are telling us that we aren't doing a good enough job uh, in, in making our complaints. Um, but we're doing a very, very good job. 
we're doing an excellent job because we are a David against a very, very strong, wealthy, powerful international Goliath, an international system which is a Goliath and is very, very hard to change. And so all of us who feel the fatigue, let's keep going. Do what you can. I'm doing what I can from my small perch in another part of the world to continue to tell the story of political repression in Bahrain uh, from the archives, from interviews. Um, it's only a small piece, um, but I just wanted to act, say that I'm in solidarity. And for all those out there feeling tired, we can rest, but it's not over. It's not a failure. And there are so many ways from power sharing to truth and justice and reconciliation uh, committees. There are so many ways to transition, so many plans that could be made um, to make a smooth transition for a better Bahrain. Those plans are out there. We have those plans um, and we're not gonna be silenced. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your impassioned speech, Stacey. Uh, our next speaker is Jawad Farouz. Jawad is a former, is a former MP from al Wafaq, uh, one of the main opposition parties in Bahrain, which has now been outlawed uh, in the country. Jawad himself was victim of forced uh, citizenship revocation from the Bahraini regime in the aftermath of the Pearl Uprising. Since then, he has also been a consummate human rights advocate and is the chairman of Salon DHR. Welcome, Jawad. Thanks a lot, uh, Andrew, and uh, I'm pleased to be with you. Uh, for sure, what gonna, I'm going to say going to be continuation of what Stacy just said, she mentioned. And uh, it is a chance that all of us to review um, political, human rights, economical, and uh, even the security of the uh, state of Bahrain. Uh, we know that, uh, that the uprising, which started uh, 11 years back, they couldn't accomplish their demands. They demanded the state of law. They demanded democracy. They demanded that equal citizenship. Uh, they demanded a uh, separate of all power within the, the, the states. And they uh, demanded the partnership uh, to run the country. Yes, they couldn't achieve it, but I believe even the ruling family, they couldn't achieve what they have to be achieved or been promised to achieve in earlier. All the time, I used to say that when British colony left Bahrain in August in 1971, there was clear promise within the ruling family that they can have legitimacy to run the country if only they provided a partnership with people of Bahrain. And that's why we had 1973 constitution and immediately on the first article of that constitution is being indicated that Bahrain is a democratic country and there is a separation of power, executive power, judiciary, and uh, we have uh, the, the legislation power and the sovereignty of the country in the hands of the people. Now yet, after half century of independence of Bahrain, the ruling family failed to accomplish that promise. And here somehow UK to be blamed, instead of putting further pressure over the ruling family to keep their promise and what being considered as a contractual agreement with people of Bahrain, they shifted toward more absolute monarchy instead of having a constitutional monarchy. So there have been a golden chances for the uh, ruling family, either through 1973 constitution, which after that we had the uh, legitimate parliament in Bahrain, which has been dissolved by 1975, uh, uh, banning that one by former Prime Minister Khalifa bin Salman, and then for 27, the state security been run. There was another chance in 2001, especially in 14 February 2001, when the current king launch was being called a national act. That chance gave 
during that time, give all Bahraini people hope that maybe through a coordination and partnership with the ruling family, we can establish a state of law and a modern state. Unfortunately, after that year, after a year of that, exactly on February 12, 2002, we could see an uh, uncontractual constitution being imposed on Bahrain. They failed the second golden chance to fulfill the demand of the Bahraini people. Then I believe the third chance was when the opposition participated in 2006 election, and they tried to be cooperative with the government. And here, once again, there'd been a lot of promises by United States and United Kingdom for the opposition when they participated after they bycotted 2002 election, that they are ready to put more pressure over the Bahraini authorities, especially ruling family, to give further room to the political reforms when or if the opposition will participate in the election. Unfortunately, they couldn't do so during their participation from 2006 till they resigned in February 2011. Why? Because the decision within the ruling court was that nothing will be changed within the constitution and there won't be any type of the political reform which can have a little bit more room for the power share within the government itself. And the way it was that just few and slight changes in the economical issues or the services is being given opportunity to the opposition to try to provide. And all that is combined over and over when people felt that even the basic freedom rights is being taken away, when in 2008, some of the activists has been detained and been tortured. And it was so surprised to all of us during that time where we parliamentarian that why the torture should be once again to be implemented. And I myself raised that question in the parliament and then has not been forwarded to Minister of Interior. Minister of Interior met with me in his office and somehow indirectly admitted there is a torture. But he said that not by me, and he was referring to the by to the national uh, security authorities, and they done that. I think that was beginning of the spark of 14 February 2011, when states started to not just uh, not implementing the, their promises even though they started their hidden plan. And I think everyone knows about the al report, which they indicated that there was been an hidden agenda, how to try to isolate the majority of the citizens from their rights and go toward further of absolute monarchy. I think all that, if we try to revise it once again, then we come to the conclusion that why people uh, uh, started to be in the street and in, 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 in very, very un, unexpected to, to, to so many politicians, to the authorities, that this huge momentum of the people which continued for almost a month from for, uh, 2011, 14 February till uh, 13 of March, where Sudanese troops, they entered Bahrain. And since then, after 11, we can see that it was a clear indication by the authority that this is will lead us to the further insecurity, to the further unbalance between the total and absolute power of the ruling family and no power with the Bahrainis, regardless of their sex or regardless of the background and so on. And once again, there was BICI report, another golden chance for the authorities when they be, when Bassouni, Sharif Bassouni submitted his report on 23rd of November 2011 to the king, giving him a clear 26 recommendation to start new way and to adopt certain of justice and try to uh, consider that this is a, another chance. But then later on, Bassouni, he himself, uh, he, he said that, unfortunately, the ruling family, they preferred the unity within them themselves as a ruling family than the unity within the with, with them and and the Bahraini people and 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 since then 
grave human rights violation occurred. And uh, I, I summarized them in an article recently, and I can say that either if we're gonna speak here about uh, the extrajudicial killing and executions, what was so clear that the trend was increasing, yet we can see that more than 200 people, Bahraini people, either they killed right away on the, by, by, by uh, a cold blood in the streets or under the torture, or they've been executed. It was so surprised to all of us, even in 2017, UPR, what was clear indication of that, that the issue of related to the death penalty to be revised and the legislation to be revised, we can see the increase of the momentum of the verdicts toward adopting death penalties. Yet we have 36 uh, cases where death penalty has been insisted. Now, five already been killed or been uh, executed. Then the rest, either they are in the list, 12 of them as they already done with all the process. And uh, it is just waiting for any final decision by the king. And there are some of them who are living abroad yet uh, uh, at any time if they been uh, be, going to be detained, then it's going to be the, the, the same case. When it comes to the issue related to the revocation of nationality, for example, it was really Bahrain, I believe, is only country which revoking the nationality of the citizens, of the citizens and forcibly deporting them outside the country and at the same time trying to provide nationality to the so many foreigners. There is a plan, clear plan, for a demographic change in the country. Since the first group in 2012, exactly 7 November 2012, when the list started with 31 citizens, and I was included uh, a part of that citizen, they said that, that, that list, that the, we, we, our nationality has been re revoked, then the trend is increased till it, it reached 990 Bahraini citizens, the uh, national has been revoked. But due to the international pressure, the, the king had to be forced to restore 551 in April 2019. Yet still we have 434 citizens, still their nationality has been not revoked. Once again, in 2017 UPR recommendation was clear that, that the authorities should stop revocation of nationality and they should restrain the, the, uh, the, national, the nationality of those who have been uh, revoked, but yet no action is being uh, taken. When it comes to the issue of the sectarian, it was so clear at the beginning of the uprising, there was intention by the, by the authority to take the trend toward the sectarian struggle, not to the political struggle. They, they faked so many uh, uh, um, fake stories that to make a confrontation between different sects in Bahrain. And they deliberately, they demolished 38 mosques to let some revenge by the Shia citizens and then could lead us to the more further violence and maybe to the civil war. But I think the people were being wise to don't try to change their peaceful movement toward any type of the violent uh, type one. And it's still, I think that all the uh, uh, human rights defenders in general, all the uh, opposition in general, majority of Bahraini people, and if not all, they are denouncing any type of, the, uh, of violence. And still, they are demanding the, the, the peaceful movement to, to reach it. Yes, Bahraini people, they didn't uh, get their demands yet, but I think it is the state which is going through the, the abnormal conditions, and it is really against the, 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 the movement of the, of, of, the, of the modern history, which is at the end, the people will get their rights and they have to have to run their state. The sovereignty of the state should be within the hand of the people. Other than that one, still Bahrain will be unstable and unsecure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your very trenchant insight there, Jawad. Our next speaker is Devin Kenny. Is Mr. Kenny is, associate, is an Arab Gulf researcher for Amnesty International. He is a prolific researcher on human rights in the GCC with a specialty in Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, and the United Arab Emirates. 
Over the past several years, he has been at the forefront in reporting ill treatment and medical negligence towards prisoners, many of whom are incarcerated for political crimes in Bahrain. Welcome, Devin. Hello, thank you, Andrew. Y'all can hear me, right? So um, the title of our webinar today linked um, the two issues of authoritarianism and stability. So I'm going to direct uh, my remarks to that connection. To understand the relationship between authoritarianism and stability in Bahrain today, I think it is helpful to look at the past two decades, basically the first uh, two decades of the new millennium, and in particular to contrast those two decades. So roughly speaking, the first decade of the new millennium was one of controlled reform in Bahrain. And the second decade of the millennium, the past decade, was one in which every important liberalizing step that had been taken in the preceding decade was reversed. The metaphor that tends to come to mind uh, for me whenever I look at this or think about this is that of an accordion. It opens and then it closes again. And at this point in time in Bahrain, we're back to a position where it's fully closed. So to be a little more exact uh, with the periods I'm talking about, because real life doesn't necessarily divide itself perfectly neatly into decades, the relevant first period is um, from March 1999, when the current ruler Hamad came to power, and up until February 2011, um, when, of course, the Pearl Roundabout uprising happened and was very harshly suppressed by the state. So when Hamad came to power, it did mark a change of eras in Bahrain. The previous era had lasted about 25 years and was ran from ever since 1975, when Hamad's father, the Emir Isa, had dissolved uh, Bahrain's first elected parliament and had suspended the constitution. So basically, for the last quarter century um, prior to this new millennium, Bahrain was in a state of totally non-parliamentary and extra-constitutional rule. And that had ended with an uprising in the 1990s, a quite sustained uprising, which lasted um, over the course of years, actually. Uh, it was the central political event of the 90s in Bahrain. So Hamad came to power. Um, fairly quickly, he declared a general amnesty for past political exiles, and he unilaterally issued a new constitution in 2002 that created a new and restricted parliament. So these were limited steps and not full democracy, uh, but they did open up a space into which an above ground, in-country, and uh, and legalized Bahraini opposition uh, came, to, came to fill that space. So this is where we get into the contrast um, between this past decade, the one since 2011, and the decade before, the first decade of the new millennium. And you can track how this has gone by looking at the fate of these newly above ground and legal opposition forces as between these two periods of time. So. Let's take al wifaq which is the largest of the opposition political groups uh, that participated in elections under the new constitutional system. al wifaq uh, arose basically from the Adawa current in the Shia community, which prior to um, the 2000s had largely had to operate in exile or else if inside Bahrain from underground. Uh, its current leader, Sheikh Ali Salman, had been pushed into exile out of Bahrain in 1995, and he lived in exile uh, in London from 1995 until 2001. In 2001, Ali Salman returned to Bahrain, and in 2000, and same year actually, in 2001 also, Al Wifaq uh, first registered as a group licensed with licensed with the government. And by 2006, Al Wifaq had become the largest bloc in the parliament. So, what happened on the other side of the equation after the watershed of 2011? 
in 2015, Ali Salman was put in prison. In 2016, the government dissolved and outlawed al wifaq and by 2018, Ali Salman's sentence had been uh, escalated to life in prison. Look at the second largest of the legally registered uh, political and Shia opposition groups in Bahrain, which was Amal. Amal uh, came from the current that used to be the Islamic Front for the Liberation of Bahrain, which had also essentially had to operate only in exile prior to the new millennium. Come the new millennium, um, Amal sought and received a license from the government as a recognized group that was in 2002, and they participated in the 2006 elections. Come this new repressive decade that we are just at the tail end of, the government dissolved them. That happened in 2012. Take the political group WAD, which basically represents the non-sectarian and Arab nationalist current in Bahraini politics. The older leader of that political current among Bahrainis was Abdul Rahman and Nuaimi. Uh, and he, again, had lived in exile for basically the entire period uh, that Amir Isa was in power. WAD came into legal existence. It, applied to the government and received recognition of its legal existence in 2001 and participated in the Bahraini political process openly and above ground. The government dissolved WAD in 2017. Outside of political groups, it was of very great value to Bahrain to have an actual independent newspaper, uh, which was Al Wasat. Al Wasat was identified by the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry in 2011 as the only independent newspaper in the country. Al Wasat was its founding was associated especially with Mansour Al Jamri, who also lived in exile from in the UK from 1987 until 2001. In 2001, he returned to Bahrain given the loosened political climate. In 2002, he founded Al Wasat and it was licensed and legally uh, recognized by the government and provided a very valuable uh, counterpoint to the, basically the semi-official papers for the period of its existence. And I state that in the past because like the three political groups I mentioned before, al Wasat was eventually eliminated by the government. In 2017, the government dissolved al Wasat uh, and its legal existence and it was shuttered and no longer publishes. And you can continue with a few other examples in this pattern, um, but I think you see the general pattern here. Um, an opening in roughly the first decade of the new millennium and a total closure of all that had opened in the decade that followed. The past is not a prediction of the future, but it is a guide. And when you recall that what preceded the past two decades in Bahrain, the end of the Amir Isa period, was a sustained and lengthy uprising in the 1990s. Looking at that history, I think the, the reassertion of authoritarianism from 2011 on uh, does not bode well for a stable future for Bahrain. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Devon. Very thorough and insightful. Our next speaker uh, and final speaker for today is Ghassan Sarhan. Hassan is a Bahraini human rights uh, uh, activist and a lawyer. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Hassan. Thanks a lot. Uh, I hope my voice is, is clear. Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to speak today about the laws uh, restricting freedom, some of the laws that has been issued since the uprising on 14th of February 2011. Uh, many changes have been uh, undergone for uh, for uh, on the Bahraini laws since February 2011, whether those restrict freedom, which are considered regression and democracy index, or those related to other economic and social issues. However, for the purpose of this uh, seminar, I will limit myself to clarify some amendments which affected, restrict, or might constitute a regression of democracy and an additional restriction of some freedoms as follows. Despite all the observation on the elected council, 
and its previous law since the moment of its establishment and the parliamentary experience for the past years, the amendments that affected the internal regulation of the, uh, let's say, the House of Representatives or the elected chamber in the, uh, in the parliament express a trend that restrict uh, the initially restricted authority and weaken even the tools that have long been considered relatively weak tools uh, that need more reforms to develop, to develop the experience, the, democr uh, the democracy experience in Bahrain. Uh, many articles and texts have been changed, some of them to keep uh, pace with the change in uh, nomiculture, and some of them had other effects. For example, Article 134 uh, changed in the year 2018 to become that. And instead of prohibiting the question, any question in the parliament from having phrases that include inappropriate phrases or that harm the dignity of persons or body or harm the higher interest of the country, they added to it. A uh, restriction that it should not include expression that harm public records, uh, national interest, uh, civil peace, or provoke hatred, discrimination, or sec uh, sectarianism. In fact, this change by adding public order and national interest made the matter lose. Who is the one who determined the national interest and what on and on what basis? Based on experience, uh, th this opens the door to consider any opinion that contradicts to the opinion of the executive authority, whether at the level of decision related to political or economic affairs and uh, in contradiction with the national interest, which limits the question and may drop it uh, in, in the elected chamber. It was also added in the same article that it may not be on a uh, subject before the legislative, uh, the legislative chapter unless it is continuing. And the office was giving the parliament office was giving the offer uh, the, the power to dismiss this question and if the member uh, is not uh, satisfied with the execution of the question because the, the condition did not apply uh, in that case the matter should be presented to the office and the office have the final decision on that so uh, the article restrict the right of a question related to legislative ro uh, role uh, thus uh, exempting any previous de decision from the authority of oversight and questioning, not to mention giving the right to the council office, which decide at the first, uh, the, to exclude the question in the first place, to decide on the matter on the second time and uh, once and for all, meaning that it may not be re-asked. Uh, also, there is an, uh, the article 136 was amended after another uh, other member of the Council of Ministers uh, was added to the ministers, if uh, one of the non-ministers answered the question, uh, it may not be presented for discussion. Still, the matter was limited to answer being communicated and given to the Council to vote on it. Article 137 has been amended also as previously. Uh, it was not permissible to ask minister, minister question within the competence of one of the council committee, except after submitting uh, the report from the council committee. A clause was also added that it is not permissible to raise more than three questions per month, and a clause that prevent the submission of a question uh, submitted by any other member in the same uh, session. Uh, Article one, uh, 145 have been added, uh, saying that the interrogation is submitted uh, to, to, uh, to the council's office to ensure its formal procedure uh, and added that if the formal condition are met, it must be presented to a committee composed of the chairman and the uh, deputy head of the collective committee who are not uh, those uh, who submitted the interrogation or uh, to prepare a report to the extent of its seriousness, supporting the uh, viewpoint of the, uh, of the interrogator. Uh, the, inf uh, the information is presented to the council in the first session after preparing it for voting without decision. The interrogation is not considered serious unless two thirds of the council member agree. So uh, no interrogation will be uh, carried on in the parliament unless two thirds of the, uh, the council member agrees on it. Uh, another uh, restriction was added to the interrogation tool that did not exist before uh, the article uh, 146 has been amended to become that it is not permissible to expedite the discussion unless the minister requested, but it was previously issued by the council and required the approval of the minister. Thus, the request of expedite the discussion become uh, a right restricted to the minister uh, themselves, uh, not the elected council. A new 
uh, articles was also added, uh, the most important of which uh, stipulates in Article uh, 170, which relate to the public discussion. Public discussion was defined, were defined within this article, the, uh, that uh, intent of clarifying the intention of the government, and it uh, must be related to the internal affairs and related to public interest only. That is, it, ex uh, it excludes uh, uh, matters related to external affairs and external agreements and open the door to adjusting the public interest and what is related to. So this is the same issue. What uh, what do you mean by the public interest and who is the one who decides which, uh, which things contradict with the public interest or go with it? Likewise, likewise Article 171 was added and which decided that the... Uh, the request of general debate must be submitted in writing, specifying the topic accurately, including justification and reasons, and the name of the member who has the priority to speak, and then it is presented to the council for approval or exclude before uh, it is not fit for discussion. In addition, Article uh, 173 added other restrictions represented uh, in limiting the general discussion so that the member debater does not exceed 10 members and uh, member discussion should not exceed five minutes only for each. Uh, and the criticism, blame, or accusation may not be directed or include a statement that violate the Constitution or law or constitute uh, to the dignity of person or body or harm the supreme interest of the country. Uh, it is evident from the text that the article uh, that the article that, uh, that uh, the discussion is limited to five minutes only and uh, and certain number and uh, this is let's say it's a rubber rest rubbery restriction so they can adjust it the way they want have been placed to accommodate any interruption of the discussion uh, represented in not violating the constitution uh, compromising the body or harming the higher interest of the country uh, article 177 also was added amended to become that the uh, finance committee must meet in both chambers, the elected and the appointed one, to discuss the draft budget, and then each community of them submit a report to the council. And instead of that uh, being the right of financial affairs committee and the elected council, as it was previously, this means that the elected council commis committee cannot issue the report or review the budget alone without the presence of the appointed Shura Council Committee. In summary, for the elected council uh, since 2011 till today, the total amendment to the laws related to the work of the elected council impose clear restriction. They reduce the power of and effectiveness of the tools, whether represented by the question or interrogation tools or even general discussion. Some matter related uh, to the state budget to be uh, added to the observation and shortcoming that have uh, uh, pledged uh, the elected assembly and the legislative authority as a whole since its establishment. In the political right acts, also uh, many have previously uh, exposed to the issue of law, law politi uh, political uh, isolation law. Concerning this law, uh, Article 3 of the law has been amended to deprive anyone who has been sentenced to a penalty from voting until he is rehabilitated, uh, contrary to the previous text, which pro uh, prohibited those who carry out uh, the penalty during the execution uh, period only. The person uh, convicted also of uh, one of the elect uh, electrical crime, uh, crime was added to it even if he had been rehabilitated, meaning he is permanently, uh, or he or she permanently lost the right to vote. In the same article, uh, uh, they have three uh, more article added to the, uh, sorry, article were added to it, uh, the, the law uh, um, to a life ban from running for parliament for anyone sentenced to criminal penalty, even if he was rehabilitated, if it's more than six months or was uh, granted a special pardon, the person sentenced to imprison for more than six months was also prohibited from running even if a special pardon was uh, issued, in addition to banning member of political societies that were dissolved according to a judicial ruling. Anyone who deliberately harm or dispute the function of the constitutional or parliamentary life was added to it by terminating or leaving the parliament work or uh, whose membership was uh, dropped for uh, the same reason. The meaning of the preceding article is that it prohibits permanently the member of the association that have been 
dissolved from the polit- their political rights to run, as well as the one who used uh, the r- r- resignation from the representative work as uh, Wafaq did in uh, February 2011. Uh, as a means of express, uh, expressing a rejection or uh, a rejection for what is happening, uh, or it was revoked for violating the internal regulation, for example, to put forward an issue that affects the body or uh, the loose national interest, as we speak uh, previously about, uh, which, which is what promote us to say that uh, the law that entered into political life aimed to take revenge of political opponent, restrict freedom, and lose an important part of the democratic uh, process, its true value. Also, there has been amendment to the law of public march and gathering. Article 11 of the law was amended to prohibit march and gathering in Manama, in the capital, and it was excluded in front of the headquarter of international or, uh, organization, provided that there was a special written permission from the head of public security, specific, uh, specific uh, 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 head of security. But uh, also uh, it was restricted and banned to have any rallies in front of malls, uh, hospitals, and any uh, places with, uh, let's say, uh, high importance related to security. So most of Bahrain, uh, we can't have any march in it because it's prohibited by law. It also banned the use of vehicles and rallies to impose a restriction on protests that have been uh, take, uh, used in Bahrain the previous years using uh, cars, which was not against the law. Uh, also, there is a lot of um, amendments to other laws that was in the same direction. And the summary, uh, the the set of laws were issued since 2011 till now are laws that affected political freedom and rights, whether for citizen, member of political uh, society or legislative authority and the freedom of uh, peaceful assembly and uh, expression, imposing additional restriction and also uh, putting more penalties or more aggressive penalties toward any violation of this uh, law. And thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that very detailed response, Hassan. I'd like to ask uh, all of you some uh, questions, if it would be possible. Uh, my first question is uh, for you, Professor Strobel. You made a very interesting comment about moral imperatives. Uh, and that it is essentially moral to support the Bahraini cause. Now, of course, like you had mentioned with your colleague, if um, you know you're looking at this in the terms of uh, you know geopolitical uh, geopolitics uh, on real politic, that doesn't necessarily matter. I would uh, I would like to ask you, you know, given the history of mass protests in Bahrain of police violence of the fact that, uh, you know, as a criminologist, that Bahrain is one of the most heavily policed countries by proportion in the world. Is this actually more than a moral imperative? Do we actually have a certain degree of evidence that says that the country is actually, you know, kept in a series of destabilizing events that have to do with the fact that the government has been so heavy handed? Absolutely. Um, I think that it is a moral imperative, but, you know, as a scholar, um, you know, just making a sort of normative declaration like that isn't really what I'm supposed to be doing based on my training. But, but I think what, what my, my sense of injustice has, and, and has led me to want to center is to start moving towards a new analytic of Bahrain that centers the lived experience of Bahrainis as the starting point for the conversation about human rights. Uh, and, and, I, and that includes people who are you know, working in the realm of international diplomacy, international human rights, people who are quite aware of the complex relationships and treaties that are going on. Um, that's all well and good, but many people who um, are working on this issue don't start from the lived experience of a majority, this is a majority underclass situation, um, don't start there as an analytic frame. And so it, along with Dr. Simon Mavon at University of Lancaster, we're currently working on centering that lived experience as a legitimate analytical frame to begin to understand uh, the Al Khalifa regime as an apartheid regime, um, given the history of slavery, given the history 
of uh, socioeconomic marginalization and ghettoization of, of communities that are uh, essentially over time have been constructed by the royal family as internal enemies, um, certainly have been the object of collective punishment for the Pearl Uprising. So a sort of regime that's very much embedded in guilt by association or even guilt by social identity. Um, and you see that through the implementation of things like mass trials or the use of terrorism um, as a legal means. So calling things terrorism, calling things a matter of national security. Um, and as Gerson was uh, sort of telling us um, a bit, uh, Gassan, excuse me, um, that, you know, then it's an entree for these really repressive measures that actually aren't national security issues. They're issues of civil rights and, and political participation. And so what for me has been um, a really big part of the moral imperative is not to stop there. People aren't necessarily convinced um, by your, you know, moral condemnation. They're not con convinced by shame, <laughs> right? The al Khalifa family could care less, um, you know, whether I find their, their behavior politically to be shameful. Um, but I think it's important to honor the, the humanity of this situation. Uh, I see a closed circuit loop. I see generations of folks who tend to be Shia Baharna Rajan, born into communities where the opportunities are limited and they are more likely, and I wish I had a number on it, but official statistics are very hard to come by, but are much more likely to end up in prison and than anyone else in the public. Um, and so for me, that's a problem of mass incarceration in addition to being a problem of um, you know, political repression. Um, and so that's where I wanna sort of shine the spotlight. Um, because I firmly believe that once we can once we can do that and provide some of that analysis um, and, and really highlight those stories, which is a lot of the work that Salon DHR does, is sort of get in there and say, here's what are happening to people on the ground, um, that we we will change the focus um, because it's really no longer acceptable for the international community uh, who may have. Uh, power and control over treaties and trade agreements and arms sales to continue to, to essentially sacrifice a majority of Bahrainis to their fate. Um, again, and for no fault of their own other than being born into, um, you know, a certain um, social identity um, in an apartheid country. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh Really very interesting and very thorough uh, examination of that. I think you've done a very, uh, you know, a very animal job of really connecting both the moral imperative and really the nuts and bolts when we talk about this with policy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stacy. My next question is for Jawad Farouz. Uh, Mr. Farouz, you know, as you know, the Minister of State, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Affairs, uh, Lord Tariq Ahmed visited um, the Special Investigation Unit in Bahrain uh, this past week. And it's like, this is an institution that ostensibly is meant to act as internal affairs when it comes to human rights violations in Bahrain, but has been implicated uh, essentially in negligence as well as also at times um, participating in cover-ups. Uh, this has been explained by human rights organizations in the past. Uh, when you have spoken in the past about creating reform in Bahrain and the role that the international community has to play with that, particularly actors such as the US and UK. How do you feel that that could be accomplished? And where do you feel the UK and the US fall into that, especially when we talk about the fact that these countries are so closely interlinked uh, as this visit to the SIU shows? Thanks a lot uh, for asking very important questions. Um, if I uh, divide them to the uh, three different uh, visions that uh, these three they have, which is uh, the ruling family or authorities in Bahrain and the UK and the United States, there is certain deviation between these three with regards to what you mentioned. Unfortunately, with regards to the uh, ruling family or authorities in Bahrain, there is totally no indication that they have political will or any 
type of the plan for any types of the reform. I believe they don't want to, and they are not willing to adopt any human rights or political reforms. There is no vision toward any type of the genuine type of the political or human rights reform. Only what we see or what we've been promised is totally cosmetic. And even when they are mentioning about it, they want it to be within the human rights reform. Uh, for example, they are uh, running in a speedy way to sign what being called the Memorandum of Understanding with OHCHR. They want to uh, uh, give a lot of shed over and uh, whitewash the issue of the non-custodial sentences or alternative sentences, or what uh, the current uh, Crown Prince Prime Minister indicated that the Bahrain could be a big prison instead of having the, the, the isolated cells or uh, the, 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 the individual prisons here, there, and so on. So what's been talked yet, it is not a vision toward uh, a deep uh, or genuine type of the human rights reforms. And instead of adopting judicial uh, uh, transitional justice or in start, and instead of having a, a serious will to implement the BICI uh, uh, recommendations or to be very uh, uh, serious to implementation of UPR reports, either 2012, 2017, and so on, they are running the way that such cosmetic act has been adopted. So it is so clear, there is no clear and serious will with regards neither human rights or political reforms. Unfortunately, when it comes to the UK, it has similar stance. Although they want to say that they are encouraging any types of reforms in Bahrain, human rights or political, but not to be speedy. The current conditions in the Gulf region in general, it is not encouraging to divert to a democratic country in Bahrain. And it will lead, as they, uh, I think, believe, especially the Conservative Party, that it will lead to further instability if any reforms has been adopted so speedy in Bahrain. Maybe, in theory, they said it is required, but it should be within long, long phases and within gradual steps not speedy UI and it's still maybe right. It is, it is not right time to implement it right away or put huge pressure over the ruling families in, 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 in GCC in general and particularly in Bahrain to adapt transition to a democratic state and so on. And yet they are trying to provide a certain technical assistance and consultation toward how to be further uh, in, 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 in act and the ground to control things without to be blamed internationally in a way that how to be within the certain international conventions, but in the same time, not to make a major sh shift uh, towards the democracy or adaptation of uh, 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 human rights values as uh, a very high standards. Only deviation within these two regions, the United States one. Yes, during uh, now uh, the, the current uh, uh, White House uh, uh, policy is that to enhance and inform Bahraini authorities to adopt human rights reforms, and there are some pressure over there. And I believe that when I see a slight change towards the human rights reforms, even if it is cosmetic, is mainly due to the United States pressure. As we know, for example, recently when the new uh, uh, ambassador, United States ambassador, just uh, on 9th of, November, of, of, of February, he met with some representative of NGO while uh, under secretary, uh, um, assistant under secretary of MENA region and North Africa, they visited Bahrain. They met uh, with the four representative of four NGO to just hear to the, from them what they will say, the current conditions. And something been said about uh, the human rights issue and so on. It was totally being rejected by Bahraini authority and they summoned even the, the, the ambassador and even they um, 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 uh, trying to follow up and give uh, the, the Minister of Interior himself, he gives clear warning to all uh, the activists and the NGOs 
as he said that what happened in 2011 shouldn't be repeated once again and so on. But it looks like the United States want to um, um, provide a certain types of the engagement with NGOs, human rights activists, and create certain pressure over the Bahraini Authority at least to adopt little bit, let me say, a human rights plan for the human rights uh, re reform where things could be a little bit more changed. But yet there is no vision toward forcing Bahraini Authority to adopt any type of the political reforms, unfortunately. Thank you for that, Jawad. My next question is for Devon. Devon, you've discussed the accordion principle uh, to a certain extent of uh, how authoritarian regimes can diffuse themselves, uh, sometimes in times of crisis, but this is really uh, not genuine reform. Uh, we've seen this multiple times in Bahrain. Uh, I mean, just as we've seen clampdowns that occur as well. Uh, and this is, I think, emblematic of what we think of as a continuing cycle of government repression that occurs. And it's like that is related to the domestic situation there that remains unstable. Forgive me for being glib, but do you feel that uh, another mass protest or another major clampdown in Bahrain is inevitable given the, the sort of, uh, you know, stereotype that has been created in foreign policy, that it is an inevitability that there will be um, a major event every decade in Bahrain. Do you think that this is true? Why or why not? Nothing is inevitable in human affairs, uh, which is why trying to guess the future is a fool's game. Um, but of course, we all engage in it. I mean, as I tried to indicate, I think you can look at the past to try and understand how it led to the present and try to predict some lines of trajectory. I mean, about the best I can say about this is that that comment that you can find repeated about Bahrain having an uprising every 10 years, it does hold true pretty well, at least if you look at 20th century Bahraini history, which is the part of it that I know a bit better. Um, and, you know, in general, um, authoritarian regimes or regimes that uh, really harshly suppress uh, basic civil political rights or human rights in general, it's, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't really proved to be a formula for stability. Um, you can find dictatorships that are stable for X period of time, basically until they're not, uh, which has tended to come sooner or later for, for all the dictatorships I'm familiar with in human history. So that's about the best I can say to that. I'm, I can't predict a new uprising or anything like that, but... Um, I don't think that in general, the repression of civil political freedom is a, is a winning formula for long-term stability for any country. Certainly. Uh, I think that's a great insight, Devon. Uh, my last question is for Gassan. Gassan, you have you know, mapped out is like just how much revision has occurred within the Bahraini legal code. This obviously is highly restrictive to civil society as well as to gatherings. Uh, this in itself it, it engages in a kind of um, double think in Bahraini society where authorities claim that it is one of the safest countries that you can be and yet at the same time it is under perpetual threats by terrorist cells, um, importation of weapons uh, from Iran um, and other pieces of, of media that is made to make the country feel like it is more or less under a state of prolonged siege. When we are dealing with these sorts of narratives, as well as with the restricted space that comes with these laws, what is the best legal case for reform that can be made as like, given these circumstances? Uh, yeah, if we are speaking about legal reforms in Bahrain, there are so many legal reforms have uh, or must be done uh, to, let's say, to avoid all of these uh, or to open the space again for uh, the de uh, democratic experience to grow in Bahrain. One of the things that I think uh, must be done or can, can have a great effect, uh, the, uh, the judicial system reforms, and especially the one related to the constitutional uh, court. The constitutional court right now in Bahrain, nobody can go to it directly except 
if he have a special permission from the court if it's looking into a civil or a criminal case and uh, you ask to go to the uh, let's say the, the constitutional co- court that the laws contradict with the constitution then uh, if they they must experience the uh, let's say the, the 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 seriousness of this uh, legal debate debate and if it's serious enough then they can get you a permission to go to the constitution to raise your case to ask the constitutional court whether this uh, law is uh, in contradict with the constitution or not and the other two ways or three ways uh, two ways is other either uh, transfer directly by the king himself to the constitutional court or by the head of uh, the national uh, of the parliament and uh, it's now the head of the elected chamber who he's the one who can have this authority one of the main things that all of these law uh, issued in my opinion it contradicts with the existing uh, constitution right now so uh, uh, one of the things if you give the freedom for people to go directly to the constitutional court and there is a, 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 a reform on the uh, judicial system, let's say, in Bahrain, then this will help a little bit so that any law contradict with the, uh, let's say, headlines of the constitution can be cancelled, especially the ones that we uh, spoke about right now. And there is a lot of laws have been issued in the past uh, years since uh, 2002 until today. A lot of them, not even uh, only the one related to the uh, to the political life, let's say in Bahrain and democratic experience, also the law related to other uh, social and economic uh, factors in Bahrain. So I think that it will be a helpful uh, that to open the constitutional court so you can go and file directly to it. Uh, without to get without the need to get a permission so anyone who felt that his constitutional right has been uh, violated then he can go directly and uh, ask for uh, or um, to the constitution court so it's ruled uh, in the uh, how uh, is this law is uh, in according with the constitution or there is a contradiction toward it uh, this is my opinion but it, uh, this kind of matter and reforms and laws it need a little bit more uh, research uh, to find uh, another way and to put some, let's say, uh, the most important thing, to put some um, uh, safety nets that even if, uh, uh, to, to stop it from being issued from the beginning instead of revoking or amending it re- uh, later on. Uh, so uh, my opinion that we have the, the Constitution and the right, what is written as a general rights for people, it's good enough. Uh, maybe we have a lot of uh, issues related to the uh, other fact, other sector of the constitution related to how uh, to express these rights and the laws that uh, restricts the tra- uh, these rights and somehow. So we need another safety nets to, or another safety factors to be put in. So uh, to make sure that this laws and the constitution will not be uh, violated by any anyone, either by the government itself or any other factor in the political scene in Bahrain. Mm, certainly talking about separation of powers and greater accountability, uh, you know, of what we think of as, you know, civil society and why it is so necessary that it remain uh, politically neutral. I mean, thank you so much for that, Gassan. With the final 10 minutes of our webinar, I would very much like to open up to questions from the audience here uh, of anything that you would like to know uh, from our speakers, as well as any perspectives that you would like. If there are no questions from the audience, um, I would be happy to um, ask a further question, especially um, uh, I'd like to ask you actually, Kassan, of, you know, you have been talking about this idea of greater accountability mechanisms uh, and how they can be put in when we're talking about adjudication. What would be your vision of that uh, when you think of the idea of uh, independent pieces of civil society in Bahrain? Uh, well, this is uh, it's a little bit a long discussion. Uh, it needs it's needed. Uh, if you are if you are, if I'm going to answer it, uh, there is no e- easy answer for that. Uh, if we go through all of the laws that have been previously the the one has been amended or not, 
then uh, and let's say in in, in general uh, the law how it was stated is just to close up any let's say back doors that the, the uh, that the government won't be uh, really uh, uh, in charge of controlling all the effects of uh, pol- uh, of political societies or the civil society in Bahrain. Uh, as it's been shown for the previous 10 or 11 years after the uprising in 2011 till now, uh, if we go through it again, the only thing that you can say that the, the government goes toward shifting most of the power from... Uh, yeah, the, there is a lot of restriction on democracy and on the elected parliament, uh, and there is a lot of issues have been uh, touched before from other uh, scholars, other uh, and the political parties in Bahrain. But in general, the the, the new amendments goes toward legalizing uh, and learning from the experience. Like for example, before uh, when you uh, resign from. Uh, from the parliament there is no uh, punishment for that and and everywhere in, in the world this type of uh, act can be considered as an expression of a free uh, f- uh, right uh, right to expression or a freedom that there is something uh, i am going to reject something i'm going to uh, resign from the elected parliament now this one if you resign from the parliament then you will not be able to uh, uh, re-elect yourself again uh, for life so uh, as as I think that uh, it's all related, even the amendment, it's all related to the political will. The political will shifted from toward uh, uh, doing more reforms to putting more restriction and to avoid and to learn from what happened. Like if someone resigned, then he will not have the right to re-elect again. If there is someone in, uh, in the political society and the political society was dissolved by uh, a judgment issued from the court, then they will not be able to re-elect again. So the, the only thing I think that uh, in the previous year that they, uh, let's say, uh, emptied the democracy scene from its uh, real effect and the civil society that also that all of the if you are going to be a, a, a member and uh, any civil society for example and you are going to uh, elect yourself for uh, the board uh, the board member then you, uh, before you have to have all your civil rights they added the clause that you have to have all of your civil and political rights so if you are not uh, you don't have the right to uh, uh, elect yourself then uh, to the parliament, then you are not allowed to be a part of the civil society. Everyone knows that most of the people working in political societies work in other uh, uh, civil society. That's drained the civil society from its members. Nobody can, uh, it's, there is a lot of restrictions. So most of the people who is active in, politi- in, in civil society can't uh, reach uh, uh, the board of directors in these societies. So they have to work as a members only, maybe. So this restrict a lot, and uh, 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 this is one of the restriction that uh, they added in the, uh, the past few years. The thing I'm thinking about to put more accountability or to do any reforms or to have a great civil society or a good and strong civil society that can confront the ex- executive authority in Bahrain and do its job as it's supposed to be, uh, there must be a political will. So what happens right now that they are leg- legalizing any act was illegal before, like uh, uh, banning someone for life from being elected in the parliament. It is something contradict to the constitution. And in a lot of countries, including Egypt, they have a previous experience related to that and the constitutional court issue a judgment saying that this is unconstitution uh, because th- it revokes uh, the right uh, the pol- political rights for uh, for citizens for life, and this is unconstitutional. So uh, all of the, the, the main object or the main thing that I can summarize uh, my opinion to have greater accountability, to have a better civil society is to have the political will for reform. Without this political will for reform, then everything we are going to do is not is, cannot be uh, cannot have any effects on uh, on the ground. And especially from our experience, that after they issued the political isolation law in 2018, legally they are not supposed or they can't uh, implement this law on the 
on what happened previously to issuing this law. So dissolving al Wafaq Society or Wa'ad or Amal, which happened before uh, issued this order, then they are supposed not to implement this uh, isolation law on their the members of Wa'ad or al Wafaq or Amal or any other society which have been dissolved. But uh, from our experience that this was... Uh, this law was implemented uh, retroactively just to, uh, let's say, all of them as to take revenge from political opponents. So the main object is to have the political will for reform. Uh, without a, a, a real political will to reform, then I doubt that any, anything will uh, will help in this matter. Thank you very much for that, Kassan. Uh, my final question is for Jawad. There has been talk by some analysts that say that essentially there needs to be a, a new political order uh, in Bahrain, whether it's a new opposition or it's like a recalibration of politics. From your view, going from the history of Bahrain and the history of its politics, do you feel that this will actually ameliorate any of the issues in Bahrain or will it simply perpetuate the current system that exists there? Unfortunately, this is the way that uh the ruling family are thinking all the time to have a cosmetic type of solutions. And instead that to go and solve things rudely and uh, to try to find a right way to solve this crisis, unfortunately, they are looking for the fake one. For instance, we have um, a councillor that has been elected for municipal councils, but they don't have any power. We have parliamentarians been elected, but they don't have any part of the legislation or observatory role over the government because there is a sure council. We have, for example, many NGOs who are registered and licensed, but all of them are Gongos one. The real one are either banned or they are in exile. And there are so many restrictions over those, which is only one yet there in Bahrain. Bahrain Society for Human Rights, where just now Hassan indicated that the majority of the active member of their board are not been allowed now to re- be elected to be part of their board. So I think the same way the government is thinking to create quote unquote opposition, which is totally could be controlled and totally will adopt the policy of the government and just the name will be opposition, but it, in core it will be really a loyal uh, groups. And yes, there are some attempts there within the authorities uh, and uh, to find out some individuals, maybe they used to be part of the position earlier, or now they shifted their views more toward further uh, agreement with the, the government issues, uh, how to solve things. So maybe they could be supported. Uh, I, I know the list of the so many current MPs who been sounded as opposition, but they already been appointed by the government by financing them through their uh, uh, parliamentary election 2008. They want to indicate that there are positions in the parliament. They want to indicate that there are elections. They want to indicate that there is a, a, a democratic state uh, with all these NGOs and political parties, but not a pure political type of the country where it could be run through a transition of power, separate of the states, a true opposition which they can have the full right to condemn or try to criticize any wrong act by the government, or they have to have total independency, for example, even to run for the post of the prime minister for so on. Not such government for sure is part of their vision. And for sure, currently at least, they will not be all allowed to play any role. Thank you so much for that, Jawad. On that note, I will be closing this meeting soon. But for a final thought, um, Devon had made an excellent insight in that there is nothing that can truly predict inevitability. That being said, I feel that one of the common threads that we've seen from uh, you know our politicians, our analysts, uh, and our academics here today is that Ultimately, the groundwork for the cyclical crisis in Bahrain has to do with the structures of power in the country, as well as also with allocation of resources. So long as the population remains deprived, so long as they lack essential freedoms, there will always be the specter of unrest uh, that exists within the country. 
And in reaction to that, those who are in charge will continue to use suppression as a means in which to maintain the idea of stability in the country, which results in a grand contradiction of stability being used to treat instability, which then causes instability. It is our hope as human rights advocates and as people who advocate for uh, greater separation of powers, rule of law, and for representative democracy uh, in Bahrain to ultimately break that cycle, as whether it be to reform, uh, whether it is through democracy, you know, whether it is through all peaceful means. As like, because as we know, as students of Bahrain, that violence only perpetuates the, the cycle of repression in the country. And we sincerely hope to ameliorate that and see that the vicious circle that had been created by the 20th century in Bahrain finally comes to an end. And with that, I'm wishing you all uh, an excellent day. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jawad. Thank you, Rasan and Yusuf. Thank you. Excuse me, Abbas. Thank you, Abbas. Thanks a lot. Okay, for then. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.